Welcome to the Apex Racing TV Weekly Roundup Podcast, your surefire way of keeping up to date with all of Apex Racing TV's broadcasted series. This week, we discuss the final round of the American GT Championship, the opening round of the AOSC Super Series, along with the NTT IndyCar and Formula 3.5 Official Series. So let's jump into the action with your host Sam Fitzpatrick and Marco Barbanera. Welcome back, Mark Gate, to the Apex Racing TV Weekly Roundup podcast. Uh, a little bit of a break since our last podcast, but it's superb to be back, and we're going to have plenty more to talk about, undoubtedly, today. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Hello, Sam. It has been a little bit of a break during the holidays, but uh, we are back. Um, as you may be here, uh, a little bit jet lagged from. Uh, from the Daytona 24 hours, but nonetheless ready to go, and already we have had plenty on our plate uh, in the new year in uh, on Apex Racing TV. Absolutely, of course. Uh, if you want to go to a specific series, just check out the timestamps in the description below, as long as we rem- remember to put them in. First up, though, you won't need a timestamp for this because we are first going to talk about the Apex Racing League american gt championship uh the final round of the season seven rounds over the course of about 10 weeks and uh we finally came to an end of it and uh what an end to the season it was at daytona as if the drivers hadn't had enough of it already and we had yeah a, a really good uh event so from what my notes i was commentating on it but i had to write notes anyway uh so bob humphrey won his first race of the season uh, in race one, that was the GTE class, because GTE and GT3 uh, in that series. Uh, so Humphrey uh, won race one. It was a really good bounce for lead. Uh, Ignacio Hortel uh, won race uh, won the GT3 race one, and that actually gave him the lead of the championship going into the last round of the season or the last race of the season. Um, also, uh, we had pretty much we had close championships all the way down. So we had the uh, GTE Pro was pretty much decided, but the GTE Am and the GT3 Pro and the GT3 Am were all mega close. And in the end, um, it was uh, James Saltz winning out the GTE Am title. Uh, we had uh, winning out in the uh, GT3 amateur title was uh, Rob Sutherland by a few points. And uh, GTE Pro winner was Mark Fletcher, and then Cheat C3 Pro winner uh, came down right to the line. So Hotel was up against Brazier, and basically whoever won the race won the championship, which was a, a pretty cool uh, element to go into. Four points between them into the last round of the season. And Brazier started on pole position, Hotel down in about 12th position. Uh, but Hotel managed to catch and then pass Brazier and uh, in the end managed to win by two one hundredths of a second. That decided the title. So certainly recommend if you haven't already seen it, uh, checking out the uh, uh, the video from that. We'll probably post something on social media as well. But uh, yeah, pretty good season. Michael, of course, uh, you commentated on one of the rounds. I think it was uh, Laguna Seca. But uh, I mean, I don't think I've ever seen a championship go down to uh, down to a photo finish, pretty much as it was. Yeah, it was it was great. I mean, let me tell you something first. I want to applaud everyone who drove uh, in the in the Daytona race. I assume most of them raced in uh, in the twenty four hour race. Uh, personally, uh, you know, I when I read the calendar, I forgot that that was the day of the Daytona twenty four hour. Uh, so, you know, having driven myself, uh, you know, an average driver with no average is an insult to average drivers. A terrible <laughs> driver. Uh, with uh, the passion for racing, I drove in the BMW 120 uh, last Sunday, two Sundays ago, official racing event. In uh, in the night at 2 a.m., I drove uh, in the Majors uh, series uh, Daytona 2.4, um, which was broadcasted by a broadcaster who uses SDK Gaming. Had, had I known that, um, I would have, uh, of course, showed a great picture on the overlay that, that I have. Then I did. Daytona, the 24-hour race, and 
unless I was fighting for a championship, I really doubt I would have showed up for uh, for your race, Sam, at, uh, on Sunday night after the Daytona 24 hours. So everyone who showed up has been absolutely great and, and, and a legend. Uh, but, you know, we've had uh, um, some close... Ch- Close calls in the in the championships here in in Apex Racing TV in the past few few months. I remember the um, Aussie Mixed and Fixed Championship coming down yeah, to the wire, but Last not lap. not disclosed. I mean, this was absolutely absolutely great. And uh, I have to say, the title challenge from Ignacio came uh, out of nowhere, especially in the second half of the season. Uh, he was able to. Uh, string together a series of good results. I think Scott Brazier missed a couple of rounds, but in the end, uh, that's uh, not to take anything away from Ignacio, who was able to, you know, win when it mattered the most and taking the lead of the championship with in, after race one. And uh, by all accounts, a great comeback to keep it uh, in his grasp and with, of course, uh, a last uh, lap dash to the racing uh, to the finish line to, to win the title. Yeah, definitely. Apologies, it, it was Mike Horder who won it. I think I miss said that. I've been getting confused between those two all season long, but Mike Horder uh, was the uh, was the driver who uh, won out. Yeah, he only won one race actually going into Daytona, and then he managed to get a double. Uh, out of the seven rounds, actually, uh, three different drivers got doubles. Daldone got one, Grazio got one, and uh, and Horder got one. So it uh, was uh, very competitive. Amongst those drivers, um, I mean, in the GTEs, uh, Mark Fletcher, of course, ending up as the champion. Remarkably, Mark, I mean, we've seen him in uh, World GT. He only won one race out of 14. I mean, this is a, a top guy, probably pro standard. He could probably get himself a pro license. And uh, yeah, only won one race of the season. However, you're saying to us after the race was complete, he never finished outside the top five in any of the races considering that he missed a round as well he couldn't afford a bad drop score uh because he couldn't drop any scores and so uh yeah he, he was a- absolutely rock solid a very mature championship put together by him. absolutely i mean consistency is uh the most important uh skill you can have even in a short championship like this uh, you know in longer championships, you may get away with a bad result here and there, but in short championships, you need to be absolutely on point with your uh, your consistency. Uh, you know, uh, that is something that I'm really striving for as a driver. Don't think I will ever get there, but uh, mm. uh, I was, uh, you know, watching, you know, again, Daytona, uh, and not only my teammates, but also the other drivers. In You know, it was not a very high split uh, this year we were in the 15th i think out of 30 but see these drivers that were able to push put lap in and lap out uh, basically down to the 100th of a second the same lap every time whilst when i was driving i was driving one second uh, you know different each lap uh, in good or bad uh, you c- consistency in a single la- you know in a single race and consistency during the whole championship is certainly i think Maybe because I don't have it, and again, I don't think I will ever have it. I think it's the best skill a driver could have, uh, you know, in real life and also in racing. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, and yeah, it was uh, really consistent. Joining from Mark Fletcher, uh, Cam Dance finishing in second place there. Uh, Tom McMahon unfortunately missed one of the rounds, and so uh, unfortunately a little bit further adrift in third. Uh, however, uh, yes, yeah, still good good championships put together by all of them, undoubtedly. Um, uh, in the GTE AM, James Saltz was the champion. Uh, remarkably, 264 points Saltz got. They, strangely, this wasn't the closest championship, uh, which shows how close the others were. But James Salt, 264. Simon Underhill got 258, and Bob Humphrey got 258 as well. Uh, the top eight drivers, uh, only separated by about 50 points, um, which was about 20% of the overall points. So mega close in uh, in that championship. I say good congratulations to them. And also, uh, of course, Wilf Sutherland uh, winning out in the GT3 Amateur Championship. Of course, now, Marco, we kind of got to discuss what, what, what are we going to do in the future. We were talking about a Pacific GT Championship, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, but uh, four rounds at Oran Park for some sort of reason. 
apparently doesn't go down well with people. I mean, there's enough layouts. We, we could certainly do that. I mean, I mean, um, something like, you know, Japan and Australia combined could be uh, a good idea. Uh, I am, I'm, of course, I am risking uh, to say something very stupid here, but I don't think there are other tracks in the, from other countries in that region, you know, apart from no, Japan no. and Australia. Um, which, which, you know, makes me think that uh, we are, uh, I wouldn't say overdue, but uh, uh, I, I would really love to have, uh, a, you know, a, a new racetrack uh, from that part of the world. Uh, of course, we know that we have several Australian tracks in development. Uh, they will be coming uh, soon, trademark. Uh, but for the time being, uh, especially for Australia, let's say that we have two usable racetracks. Uh, I'd say, uh, because, you know, of course, Oran Park, uh, I love it, but... Uh, well, Oran Park 1 and Oran Park 2, <laughs> those are two. <laughs> well, it, it would be, you know, uh, it's it's crazy that out of all the tracks that we have, that we have in A-Racing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, in that region, there are the only two racetracks that go in a figure eight, no, Suzuka and Oran Park. But yeah. uh, instead, you know... We could call it a figure eight, uh, uh, you know, um, championship, which would be, of course, terribly false advertising because it's you know, not really. But, you know, it would intrigue people. Uh, but that that will be that, I think, for the appeal of the championship, even though I would love to see a full field of GTEs and GT3s running around Oran Park, if you ask me, would be a carnage, uh, but it would be certainly something uh, entertaining, maybe for a week 13 in the future. Of course, in the shortest, uh, most chaotic layout possible of the track. It, honestly, I, I, it's a fantastic circuit, that, and it's a shame that's not used more, um, because it, it's a proper figure of eight as well. When, when you're at Suzuki, you don't actually notice it's a figure of eight, because the circuit seems uh, so normal, uh, usually. I mean, it just feels like another bridge, usually when you go under, and then when you're going over, you have absolutely no clue. Uh, but that's a proper figure of it, a nice, nice bridge that you uh, that you use. Uh, but uh, no, may maybe it's other ideas uh, will come to fruition in terms of what we can do for that. So um, yeah, the Apex Racing League American GT comes to an end, and congratulations to all the series champions in that championship. Next up, we'll talk about IndyCar, uh, the NTT IndyCar official series. Uh, Michael, you were commentating on this one. I saw the end of the race and what an end it was. However, can I just brief us what happens in the first, well, 90% of the race? Absolutely. It was, uh, you know, we last time we went on an oval, it was two weeks ago, it was at Richmond. We had something like 15 cautions. Uh, and on top of that, uh, uh, it was over uh, under uh, the yellow flag, so we didn't have, we didn't even have a fight for the for the for the win. It was a f single car split in in Richmond, uh, so sorry, a single split race. So we had twenty six cars uh, on track, in, and you know Richmond, point uh, seven something of a mile of an oval, so. Mostly it was single car spins. It, uh, it's a very treacherous racetrack, uh, that one in Richmond. Here in, uh, in Olmsted, uh, it was the opposite because the race split uh, almost at the very last second. So we had a small but a very, very competitive field. I think the strength of field was uh, around 4.5 Ks. As a matter of fact, we only had one caution. And that caution was because uh, of something that I experienced myself uh, a couple of years ago. Something that's wrong in the code, probably with iRacing, racing, because uh, um, a few years ago we were doing an NASCAR A fixed race, and lo and behold, I spun in turn three and went straight into the infield grass. There's you know, ample, ample grass space there because of the fact that uh, there is a road course also on the inside. So instead of uh, you know going 90 degrees back into the racing line, especially because I would have got a 90 degrees into the racing line on the banking of turn three and four, I went down and I followed the road course, which is miles away from the track. I did the road course chicane, and if you do that, then you are pointing straight at the pits. For some reason, the 
system decided that that was uh, dangerous and he threw the caution. And the same thing happened. Uh, and I remember that people in my race were saying, what happened? What happened? And I was quickly, you know, alt f to, you know, because I, it, was, it was embarrassing, you know, of course. Uh, <laughs> the same happened here. Uh, driver went into the grass, uh, was there, uh, and, uh, and the caution came out, even though he was, again, miles away from the racing surface. So if it wasn't for that... I'm quite confident we would have gone green flag all the way. Um, the weather was horrible. It was uh, uh, one of the hottest races I've ever seen in racing. Uh, basically, the drivers had, uh, I'd say, three or four laps uh, of uh, good uh, tires after the restart. Uh, and then it became uh, hell, uh, re literally hell. It was impossible to, to follow. It was very easy to lose the car. Um, the aero push was absolutely crazy, and the tires were dying very, 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 very quickly. So drivers were uh, forced to be creative if they wanted to make the move uh, and win the race. And in the end, that is exactly what happened because uh, uh, there was uh, a fantastic, uh, uh, you know, strategy strategy call by the uh, eventual uh, race winner of course simon bryant who pitted uh, um, late later than uh, expected usually that's not a good idea because uh, you, you he stayed out uh, quite a lot uh, more than the others uh, which usually means that you are going to lose uh, a boatload of time uh, when you make your pit stop yes you are in the lead but then the drivers who pitted before you would have gotten you know alpha second per lap if not more but uh, thankfully for him, he was able to uh, use the fact that the race stayed green to put in fast lap after fast lap. And then, of course, we had uh, a crazy, well, not crazy, very respectful, but, uh, you know, very emotional, uh, very uh, enthralling moment of Bryant passing Adam Blocker in the very last lap and bringing home a very well-deserved race victory. I would say, despite... Uh, you know, maybe the race because of the weather, not fault of the drivers being a little bit less exciting than usual uh, because of the difficulty to pass. I'd say that we got, uh, me and Austin uh, were uh, very happy because we were a bit, uh, you know, repaid by, by the racing gods after the disaster that was Richmond two weeks ago. So congratulations to Bryant uh, because he got uh, uh, really uh, a tough tough thing to, to pull out especially at this level you know to pit this late and be able to win the race yeah it was uh quite it, it, it was quite incredible i i mean i saw the results at first and then i kind of thought that was a close end and i kind of thought oh wow like you can you could see the the relative i mean going down so significantly at every corner it seemed to be kind of three tenths of a second then a tenth just going onto the straight such was his momentum um, and it was absolutely superb, and yeah, with a uh, with a lap to go, being able to uh, to pull off the overtake uh, was fantastic. Um, in terms of the championship, Marco, how is that one shaping up? Because it's uh, starting to, uh, to to kind of take form now. Is uh, is the championship? The uh, drivers are uh, getting used to the car now. Of course, we stay at Homestead, I believe, with the uh, with the road course. Oh yes, absolutely. That was uh, going to be my next point, of course, because uh, uh, the series organizers decided uh, for the for a double header. Uh, of course, they will be racing at the road course B, which is the one that does basically the infield section, and then you go through NASCAR three and four once again, uh, instead of uh, doing the you know the access road where uh, I caused the caution many years ago, which is sensible, I'd say, because uh, of the fact that there is a little bit of a uh, you know elevation change so to speak between the apron and the racing uh, surface there on the on the front stretch which is still a little bit of banking uh, and that is usually a death sentence for the for the for the front wing of formula cars but yeah with one week more than uh, second place adam blocker is in the lead so far with uh, 1306 points uh, is in front of uh, Simon Bryant, who has six weeks counted out of seven uh, available so far. He's got 864 points. He's in front of Andrew Wood, who sadly we haven't seen, I think, a lot of times in the Friday Night SOF. He's got 809 points. 
John Downing and Clark Archer round up the top five. Then uh, I would keep an eye on Andreas Eich because he's in sixth place, 660 points, but only five weeks counted. So he still has a lot of time uh, to cover uh, back to ground. Uh, Liam Queen also is uh, uh, there or thereabouts with only five weeks counted. Uh, expecting a bit more out of other drivers. Uh, of course, uh, Henry Bennett, he only has three weeks counted this, this season so far, so he needs to do uh, basically all the races from now on to uh, be able to compete for the title. But uh, again, long way to go. And of course, remember, for those who are not uh, used to this, uh, you need to do only eight weeks out of 12 to qualify for a full season. Therefore, your best, best eight results are counted in the grand scheme of things for the championship. The other races that you don't do or that you do and are not good enough get discarded. So plenty of time for these drivers, of course, to, uh, you know, so some drivers, of course, are cherry picking uh, the races. Let's say an oval specialist might do all the six ovals and two road courses where he feels particularly confident in, uh, vice versa for the road specialist doing the opposite. So. Uh, yeah, look, looking like uh, it's going to be a very interesting second part of the season and interest to see how it will go in the road course B because I always say it before Detroit, it was, uh, and yeah, not considering Montreal for some reason, this was the closest thing we've had to a street circuit. The walls in the infield are super close. Well, it maybe in the other version it's very similar to a road course because of, of course you have the chicane with the tire barrier so very close you know you don't have banked corners uh, in city streets now as in the road course b but uh, still one of the best if not the best roval that we have on iRacing apart from new hampshire yes it, new hampshire is the one with the external yes bit, isn't it yeah, yeah i wouldn't even consider it a roval it's like uh, more than a roval it's it's a, it's a work of art. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, yeah, so I'll be back, of course, uh, next Friday. Um, yeah, certainly do not miss uh, next round of the IndyCar official iRacing series. So next up, uh, well, we'll talk about uh, iRacing and the Apex Racing League as well. Uh, first up, Mark, I guess the uh, Daytona 24 Hours, it went quite well. I remember a couple of years ago, I think it was two years ago, when we had a lot of server issues. I don't think I was even able to race, uh, potentially. Oh, no, sorry. I think everyone got disconnected, like, every four hours or something not sure if you raced in uh, that particular edition i think it was 2018 um but it's uh it's testament to our racing that these events have got improved a lot i realized there was a little bit of a registration issue at the start however it went relatively without issue it, it's it's good to see yeah I, I was racing two years ago actually that was the first ever race of 1050 barbanera racing which of course, as all the world knows, made a comeback for this year's Daytona 24 uh, to celebrate our two-year anniversary. We were lucky in the fact, the sense that we were in the second split. You know, maybe the higher splits were, I, th I think, I remember, were a bit luckier uh, two years ago uh, in that race. So, but yeah, uh, there was a little bit of a... We were able to register the car. Um, we registered it very, very soon, but then the session uh, was a bit late in starting. Uh, actually, at a certain point, uh, the website crashed, then the forums crashed, widespread panic all over the place. <laughs> uh, but as it happens, usually when the servers don't launch, uh, actually I was very calm because I know that I racing, uh, if the server is not starting, uh, then the clocks are not starting. Therefore, uh, we just had to wait a bit more for the servers to open, and when we came into the server, practice had started, uh, you know, for a couple of minutes, uh, if not uh, less than that. And uh, thanks to the new system, which I absolutely loved, we had uh, uh, 30 minutes of practice, and then qualifying was in race. So there were there was actually you had 38 minutes to get into the server, uh, so it was plenty of time, and. Uh, and yeah, so apart from that widespread panic moment uh, of the 
of the registration the race went without a hiccup it was uh, something i don't know what they did uh, with uh, daytona this year but it was uh, fps wise a nightmare even with all the details low and you know because you know i do a lot of broadcasting i i have a very beefy system uh, but uh, on the final portion of the backstretch, uh, sorry, on the final portion of the infield section, uh, all race long my FPS tanked to like 45. And as you as you, as you can remember, uh, our broadcast, well, not our broadcast because Samuli has got like a NASA worthy computer, but me and you <laughs> were having trouble during the roar. Um, other other uh, other TV uh, other broadcasters. Uh, um, Top end broadcasters, I'd say, had problem with their uh, uh, with their races from Daytona these past few days uh, with the same issue. Uh, something uh, is uh, very wrong with the track because the CPU goes through the roof. It's absolutely undrivable uh, and unwatchable. Sorry, more than under it, I'd say when the FPS dropped to like 45, I didn't really notice it. But of course, it's terrible when you're watching a broadcast and the cars start blinking left and right. For comparison, I did a race uh, earlier this morning uh, in, uh, the, in the IMSA series uh, at Le Mans, which is a very, very uh, heavy track. Uh, and of course, IMSA just like uh, Rolex 24 at uh, the DPs, uh, GTs, GT3s, you know, you name it. And the CPU bar was basically not moving. It was there, didn't have a single issue. So. There must be something that's, you know, uh, messing with Daytona this year. Uh, but apart from that, I mean, it, it went uh, very well. And, you know, the daylight, I mean, the, the sun, the sunset and the sunrise. I mean, I wish I had a date to show her the sunrise and the sunset during the 24 hour race. It was uh, absolutely gorgeous, especially with all the HDR turned on and uh, all the nice stuff. It was beautiful. Sadly, I wasn't driving in either case, but you know that's why I wanted to have a date, uh, you know, for uh, uh, for the race because it, uh, uh, you know, it was a very, very, very exciting, uh, a far cry from you know. To uh, last year also, we didn't have the the night transition, right? I think Sebring was the first, if I'm not. I no, think or, so. Yeah. Or maybe, or maybe. Or, or Bathurst was the first, I think. Yeah. Well, the first I can say that was the Bathurst, uh, you know, two hours for all the wrong reasons, but I digress. And uh, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> it, it was beautiful. Great event, you know, can't wait to do an, another one. I, I will sit out Bathurst uh, for obvious reasons because, you know, I'm not going to finish the race. Uh, and I want to be, you know, especially because my teammates want to run with the Porsche Cup car, which we, we, you, you know, I have uh, b b bad, uh, bad history with that car around the track. Already gearing up for Sebring uh, in uh, in a month's time. Well, we've already discussed Bathurst a little bit, which will be the next special event. And of course, Apex Racing League uh, very happy to announce that we'll be uh, hosting a Bathurst two hours event the weekend before. It'll be on the 1st of February, so it'll be the Saturday. Uh, we'll be starting off at about 2 in the afternoon, I believe. Uh, we'll do a start for that one. Um, I, I mean, we, yeah, we've already talked about it a little bit. Last year, it didn't go brilliantly. I, I think I've had three major misdemeanors when it comes to setting up sessions. One of which, of course, came in the American GT, uh, where I put all the GT3 cars in front of the GTE cars around Montreal. Uh, guess what? That didn't happen. That didn't go too well. Uh, I think Bathurst is the other major one. Uh, where we uh, started the race not at 6.30 in the morning. No, no, no. 6.30 in the evening. <laughs> and so we had uh, accelerated time of day, uh, two hours, um, or maybe even more, uh, 90 minutes, apologies. And it was in the absolute pitch black. And <laughs> none of the drivers had prepared for it. There were no checkside lights. And the lights on iRacing at this time as well barely did anything and uh, some drivers managed to do very well of course that wasn't your downfall mark hey? um instead you got distracted after uh, potentially maybe even getting a podium in that race um but i i've, I've heard i mean we, we were talking earlier on and you, you were saying how you might take parts in 
in that potentially i mean what what class would people have to take part in to to avoid your your undoubted race win i mean you don't want to enter the same class as marco you've got, you've got absolutely no chance of beating him. well uh you know after the bad result with the porsche cup car i might switch to gt3 for for this year but uh uh, you know, I still have to think because, of course, at the same time, driving with the GT3 will mean that I will have to actually be faster than the Porsche Cup cars, which is not a given. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. And the Porsches are really quick around Bathurst. I mean, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, to be fair, I'm a bit scared of this track and this race, but I, I really, on the other end, I want to redeem myself from my dreadful performance of last season. So we'll see, we'll see. It's going to be it's going to be a decision that I will have to really ponder carefully. I don't want to ruin anyone's race, but at the same time, it would be a good punchline for every joke for the dull moments of the broadcast. So, you know, I'm very generous and I like to help uh, the needy uh, in this case commentators who of <laughs> course after a bit. Uh, I mean, it was a uh, uh, must have been very sad for you because last night, last year, it had pitch black darkness. Uh, at the very least, you had uh, you know a comic punching bag running around until my you know my demise uh, on the on the backstretch. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, uh, you know, very, very entertaining race. I'm about to say last year, and it should be very good this year. So certainly, if you want to take part, uh, GT three and Porsche Cup cars it's a really good preparation for bathurst three pound entry fee just to cover the uh the broadcasting costs of course so uh hopefully we'll see you for that one so two more series for us to discuss next up we'll talk about a very exciting series that we uh, covered for the first time on apex racing tv on the iRacing esports network uh, and that is the aosc super series which has nothing to do with another real life championship and in that uh was the first ever race of course we've ever broadcasted for our race around spa so team race two drivers per team and it was uh it was very good packed out grids 50 teams i think out there and evolution racing team uh zero eight Eight was it? I believe it was. Uh, absolutely dominated. Uh, they uh, they led from pole. I say dominated. I mean it's a mega competitive field. However, apart from a little bit of a of an issue at their first pit stop, where I think they maybe took tires whilst other drivers didn't. Apart from that, they led all the way. Won by about fifteen seconds in the end. Um, behind them was the ERT one four three. Uh, their teammates a really good start for evolution race team they held off pursuit sim racing after a really good undercut in the later stages it was a fantastic battle for second place involving about four cars on the most part uh the slight issues though for mac one esports pink who finished a distance 15th after leading in the opening stages uh, had penalties and spin and uh spins and all sorts um i'm not sure michael if you managed to catch any of the race but i mean it's it's fantastic on Apex Racing TV. I mean, it's an absolute pleasure to broadcast such a competitive field. I mean, these guys are some of the best on all of iRacing and to see this action in particularly the V8 supercars, a car which, uh, from what we've seen on other series on Apex Racing TV, has uh, always been one of the most entertaining cars on iRacing. I've been following the organization process, uh, you know, in our in our private channels of course and i i have to say that uh, i think that the that the guys uh, from aosc uh really meticulous uh, i am you know the i have to say the graphics uh, on the screen reminded me of a certain real life series uh, which races in australia which i should not sh 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 will not name no. uh, but it, it i mean it really looked like the like looked like the the real thing and to have this uh you know team-based format uh and the, of course, the, the names. I have to say that there is something wrong with iRacing once again, but this is not a fault of, of you know, Apex Racing TV or the series, etc. I've been noticing during our uh, Euro V8 broadcasting that the cars at a certain distance look like uh, they have much less detail than what they should have in close-up shot. And trust me, I tried everything uh, 
uh, even removing the um, eye memory swap low res cars, something like that, no? Uh, so I noticed that the Euro, the 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 the, the V8 cars uh, at a distance uh, during our Euro V8 broadcast lost a little bit of detail. It was actually not quite ugly, and same happened here, sadly. So this was just something wrong with the racing. And you know what 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 other car is affected by this? The Skip Barber. As you, as you know, touching uh, very quickly back on iRacing, the, the Ski Barber is now available for uh, AI Racing, and the cars in the distance uh, appear to be without driver. Uh, you know, then you see the driver slowly popping into existence uh, the more the car comes to you. So, again, iRacing uh, doing something wrong. I don't know, maybe with the new with the new surface, uh, you know, the new spec maps model uh, modeling. I don't know. Back back to the race then. Uh, beautiful to see these cars run around. Uh, uh, an historic track like Spa Francorchamps. Champs. So this is going to be quite a, uh, uh, you know, in, inter interesting championship. Sam, uh, because of the way the format is, uh, yeah, like we are saying is uh, is uh, is uh, you know laid out. Um, so uh, how was the race? I mean, you talked about uh, ERT uh, dominating uh, the the race, but uh, what what was your impression from from this series? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it was a really good, uh, strong start to the season. And, yeah, I, I mean, ERT certainly did look uh, marginally faster than everyone else. However, I mean, there's so many variables in play. It, surprisingly, there were two faster pairs available for each of the teams, so they could afford a couple of issues. Uh, but one of the elements I really liked, actually, was the safety car element. So similar to, I mean, the only series that I can recall having a similar policy is uh, DGFX. Uh, which I'm sure a few listeners uh, may have taken part in over the years. Uh, but if you stop on the side of the circuit and you need to get a tow back to the pit, you have to request it from the stewards and they will uh, put out a safety car. And fantastically, from uh, f from from the uh, organisers, they actually use a manual safety car rather than the automatic safety car. iRacing has a decent algorithm when it comes to that, but when it comes to kind of wave arounds and such. Of course, it's completely in iRacing's hands and sometimes it can cause a few issues on the uh, on the road circuits. But on uh, with a manual safety car, much con much more control. And it uh, bunched up the fields a couple of times. So I think we got uh, maybe only two or three of them. And uh, it did yeah, bunch everyone up, but uh, none in the last two and a half hours. So that was kind of quite a good uh, sprint to the end of the race. Next up, uh, next week we go to the solo series. So, of course, it's all part of one series. However, uh, four endurance rounds and ten sprint rounds. Uh, so we got 150 kilometers round Brands Hatch. And Marco, we've, I, I I can't remember the Euro V8 ever visiting Brands Hatch in the past. This is the Grand Prix layouts, of course. I mean, it's usually a tricky card to overtake in round Brands Hatch. That's going to be insanely tricky. I imagine qualifying is going to have to be quite important i if i'm not mistaken it was the final race of the first year johnny brando won the title so two you're seasons right ago season five on the yeah. sprint uh, but that was the indie layout so um it was uh you know certainly not the, you know a little bit more chaotic uh, than the than, than the than the full grand prix layout but uh, it's a tough place to pass i'm i'm sure these drivers will find a way even though you know, with live race control, uh, it's uh, you know it's uh, going to be a little bit uh, tougher to make some missed minor, I, I would say, and uh, you know barging your way through the drivers. But of course, we know that different race controls have different you know levels of uh, you know. So some of them are more more uh, you know hard uh, uh, and uh, give the drivers less breathing room than others. But yeah. It's going to be, of course, qualifying super important, staying in front super important, uh, tough place to pass once again. But and, and of course, with a big field, it's going to be super exciting to see how these drivers uh, will uh, will perform uh, in the race. Yeah, so that will be uh, back again on Friday. We'll be in the morning. I have to get up at a decent time. Great sadness. Uh, but that will be on at uh, ten forty-five GMT next Friday. So certainly uh, recommend uh, checking it out. It'll be superb. It's far. I'm sure, it'll be superb at the reception the rest of the season.
So finally, our last series we'll talk about is the Formula 3.5 Championship. Marco, you were commentating on this one at the Nürburgring GP circuits, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I, I caught a little bit of it. I, I saw the results and I caught a little bit of it. Um, a few drivers, a little bit out of position, it seems, making a few moves. And there seems to be quite a bit of contact as well out there as well. I imagine not too many uh, friends were made out there. It was, uh, you know, a tough couple of weeks for the, especially for uh, for positive sim racing in the, in the in in the brand such uh, sorry in the Philip Island race that was of course the one before this uh, basically at the first proper breaking zone of the of the racetrack uh, Tim Delisle the championship leader got uh, punted hard and uh, of course was forced uh, uh, you know to make a long long comeback which I think finished in P four or five this uh, time around it was his teammate Greg Olson that at the very first corner uh, got. Uh, uh, it in the back and was forced to make uh, on, again a big big comeback uh, so and that that was that close to being like a massive shunt for the entirety of the field this basically gave Tim Delisle the chance to pull away uh, but behind him uh, it was one of the most exciting races of the season and uh, I was doing some research before the broadcast uh, in the in the official forum for the car and the people were uh, very, very uh, uh, concerned uh, during practice and in the other races of the week before this uh, about the fact that the, 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 the track basically was consistently posing a threat to the cars, uh, the way the car jumps, uh, uh, you know, on some of the sections of the racetrack uh, was, you know, put the car in, in basically you were all, always driving on the edge. And the race uh, showed this uh, 100% because it was uh, absolutely uh, tough to k keep the car on the track. We saw many mistakes, but equally we saw some beautiful overtakes, const constant overtaking left and right. Uh, we all also had a scary moment for Paul Hilbrink, who finished second. He was trying to catch Tim Delisle, they talked to us in the in the post-race interview, and he said that uh, the only way he was able to, to catch um, uh, Delisle was if he was able to string like super fast lap times. So he was pushing really hard, and he pushed too hard at a certain point. He spun, uh, coming out, I think, of the Schumacher S, and he hit the wall on the right side of the, of the track, but luckily for him, he hit the wall basically square, uh, side on, uh, basically with the side of his wheel, the side of the wall. So he was unbelievably able to continue and uh, not only continue, but also keep his second place. So Erka Lidstrom uh, had to settle for uh, for third place. But again, many. I think we also had a puncture. We are still not sure about that, but uh, one of the drivers had to come to the pits and the car was looking uh, a bit, uh, you know, resting on one side and it was not a suspension issue because he came in changed tires came out and the car was back to being fine of course this car using the new tire model v7 so that would make sense uh, we also had a, a puncture i think in the uh, dynamics uh, endurance series uh, sorry the abruzzi it is uh, yeah and uh, speaking of, we, we will talk about that like in, in a second. So in the end, the line won from Ilbrink and Lindstrom. Sirotkin Fort also uh, had to settle for uh, fifth place after a great comeback. Uh, same as in the IndyCar series, Sam, we have drivers with different kind of, uh, of uh, uh, weeks counted. The team Delisle, our championship leader, has got six weeks counted so far, and he's got 1,333 points. Uh, Paul Hildbrink has got five weeks counted. He's got 1,006 points. Rob Bohr has got uh, six weeks counted and uh, an even 1,000 uh, 1, points. Uh, also, Edward Samborski uh, is very close. Greg Olson as well. Uh, so, again, we are waiting for the championship to... Uh, I, 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 I don't make calculations in this official series until we get to the eight weeks mark. Then we can start to have a rough idea of where everyone is granted, I think, Delilah Lilbrink and maybe Rob Bohr, who has been very consistent, 
um, it could be the drivers who fight for the championship. Maybe some balls can also but need to string some good results. And, and this Saturday, we will be racing in Barcelona, thankfully in the historic layout. So I don't know if you are uh, old enough to remember actual races being held in this version of the track. So Shockingly, having... I can't. <laughs> okay, so before they made the, the works, uh, uh, the final corner, uh, to what it is today, the, the final corner was basically a long left right-hander which brought you straight back to the start-finish line. And of course, this is very exciting for me because uh, uh, I think that uh, the way DRS works with these cars, they will not suffer too much from the dirty air because this is, a, I mean, F1 cars suffer from dirty air and they basically take that corner at half the speed, if not um, less than, you know, because they add to the chicane. And still, they have problem accelerating, and that's what makes it difficult for them to follow on the straight. But the way these cars have been, uh, even at the Nürburgring, uh, had a chance to, uh, you know, follow each other in the draft, and of course use the DRS to make passes, it's going to be a very, very exciting race at the historic racetrack, uh, historic layout. And of course, I, I, I touched on this briefly. My understanding, of course, is that... Uh, this Sunday, uh, we will be back in Daytona once again, but this time for the uh, for the Sim Racers World Abruzzi Endurance Series Round Two, with with uh, of course the GT cars uh, joined by the TCR cars and uh, the Porsche Cup cars from Daytona. So if you didn't have enough of your Daytona International Speedway fix, well, that's a chance to have uh, one more because we will be racing for uh, just about seven hours, even though this will be a, a lap race and not a timed race. And of course, uh, for these drivers, uh, the first time to come back after uh, the first round of the season in Barcelona, I'd say. And of course, there are drivers who, drivers who want to uh, you know, uh, confirm their good result, drivers that want to redeem themselves from a not, not, not good performance. But in the end, I would say that uh, it was a very entertaining race uh, first time uh, around in Barcelona. And of course, Daytona, a more, even more endurance, uh, endurance uh, style championship, uh, sorry, endurance style racetrack. So, uh, this will be very interesting, especially with the drafts. And of course, we had this problem in, 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 in Barcelona. I think this will be even worse, quote-unquote, in, uh, in Daytona. The fact that these Porsche Cup cars have massive straight-line speed, terrible brakes, so I can already imagine the dramas that we'll, we will have at the bus stop and in turn one when they have to contend with the GT3 traffic uh, during the race. Definitely. I mean, we should have the Kia mixed in with the TCR because the Kia would probably be the fastest car out of all of them. Um, it is an absolute rocket down the straights. So unfortunately, just with the Audi uh, TCR, though, um, yeah, that'll be a great challenge round, uh, round uh, Daytona, apologies. And of course, second round of the season. Um, yeah, it should be one of the quicker rounds of the season, I guess, with the amount of straights that we've got. But uh, of course, a thousand kilometers uh, to negotiate for the drivers. And uh, yeah, that will be uh, hopefully mega competitive. Hopefully, a few more teams have uh, have joined the series. Um, and Ian Reitz, of course, will be uh, looking down on the drivers uh, stewarding that one. I think all the way in terms of other stuff we got on uh, on Apex Racing TV next week. Of course, we got uh, the AOSC as well. And the thing that I was looking forward to most, Marco, is the U of V8 Supercar Series, so sponsored by Race Tech, of course. We've already had the media day for that, but that that showed really promising signs. Round one is coming up very, very soon. Uh, that's going to be super competitive. We've got a larger grid than ever. We could have a massive reverse grid potentially. And I think there's a lot of midfield drivers who are really taking the step up with this uh, with this new car. And of course, we will be racing... Uh in my own track of Monza. Well, I consider Imola to be my own track in racing, but let's not digress over that. In the traditional uh, uh, standard format of a sprint race and a feature race uh, with the reverse grid, 25 and 45 minutes with 10 minute 
practice in between the two events. And of course, Monza without the chicanes is going to be absolutely crazy, especially because these V8s can crank out some serious top speeds. It is going to be absolutely crazy. Uh, you really, really don't want to, to miss that because I'm expecting some fireworks. By the way, if I can digress, we have just finished on Monday the first ever esports championship on a racing organized by the Italian Automobile Club. It was a pretty big deal. And we had, you know, because we raced in Monza with the Ferrari, you know, fixed setup, uh, whatever, no? So we had pre qualifying and we had uh, qualifying races, and then we had the semi finals with 30 drivers in each race, going down to 15 drivers from the first, 15 drivers from the second to compete in the final, which was Monday. Uh, oh, for us is last night, but of course, I uh, don't know when you will hear this. And out of all the drivers, of course the winner was not Italian. I mean, yeah, technically, of course. And <laughs> one of the quickest guys in the racing and also a friend of mine, uh, Gianni Vecchio, but of course, you know, he's from Germany. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> even in our own championship, on our own track, with our own car, organized by our own automobile club Italians cannot win <laughs> going the you know following the example of Ferrari of course once again Gianni is uh, of Italian descent he speaks uh, very good Italian and of course he, he was uh, the quickest driver uh, in, 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 in of the day both in this in the first semi-final and in the final so a very well deserved winner and on top of uh, going to the prize giving ceremony of the Italian automobile club in the next few weeks, he won two tickets for the Grand Prix uh, later uh, down later later this year. So a pretty cool prize, I'd say. Um, I had the honor to commentate. Sadly, there were no awards for best commentator. Uh, you know, I would have loved uh, ah. you know, to have a ticket or two. I I think we'll have to settle for being a marshal this year at the, if they call me for the. I will do the Formula E race. So check out for me in the on your screen. And yeah, no spoilers on the race, by the way. I still have to watch the second half yes. of the Formula E. Uh, yeah, it, yeah. That's so fun it is. It was good. Um, yeah, I mean, if they need a sidekick, just <laughs> call me up and I I will be there in, in a hurry, undoubtedly. Um, so I think that uh, pretty much covers all the stories that we're that uh, we've seen in the last week or so. Um, I mean, I've already talked about a couple of series, Marco, that uh, we're looking for next season, uh, or next week, sorry. Is there anything else which uh, has caught your eye? Well, apart from the, like I said, I am uh, a very happy chap because uh, of the fact that the Skip Barber is now available on, uh, on the AI. And as you maybe have seen in our private channels, uh, I've already went crazy with... Uh, with the SDK gaming software, recreating uh, to a T the uh, the um, uh, basically F1 graphics. Of course, I'm not sharing everything because you know I don't want uh, to get a lawsuit for uh, for us and, <laughs> and Pascal. But that shows the power of the of the SDK gaming software, which we used basic by the way for the. Italian uh, Automobile Club Championship uh, after I pushed for it and it was of course very well received by everyone so uh, I mean uh, excitement uh, for new 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 cars uh, that uh, um, my a new tracks that might be coming uh, to, the, to the AI I, I think that uh, now we are uh, after a bit of a patch here and there we are on a holding pattern for iRacing because uh, next step I think there will be the big release of the GT4 car uh, in, in the next build uh, still we are seeing that in the, when, in the mid-season patches that we are having they are uh, releasing new content for, a, for AI which makes me think that they have uh, quite a few cars already in store and they are releasing them uh, one by one and then I'm expecting for the uh, season two release a big release of cars altogether. Hopefully, hopefully oval. Um, judging by what they are saying on uh, on what Steve Meyer said on Twitter during a Q and A, he said some some stuff which was true because he said that new cars were coming, new car and trucks were coming 
uh, in the AI next week and we had them. The Skip Barber and then we had uh, Mid Ohio and Road Atlanta. And then he said that they are trying their best to give us oval racing AI before the Daytona 500 uh, of this year. The Daytona 500 which will be February the 16th. So keep ticking your clock and hopefully uh, we will have uh, oval uh, AI racing in a racing. Yeah, it's going to be epic. I'm, I'm so. I think I'm, I own one of the NASCAR cars. Um, the uh, I think the uh, the the top one uh, A series. Um, mm-hmm. which uh, I, I think I did one race around Bristol. And apart from that, I haven't really driven it. Uh, partly because there's very few races, of course, during the week. So AI would be absolutely terrific. Uh, with that, undoubtedly. Uh, certainly, fingers crossed that we uh, that we see this. And of course, uh, if they are released. We will certainly talk about it next week, undoubtedly, for a uh, for another podcast, and we'll discuss all of Apex Racing TV's uh, races that we broadcast over the next week or so. You do not want to miss it. Uh, but for me and for Marke, uh, we'll say goodbye, and we'll see you next time for another podcast. Time for another podcast. Time for another podcast.